Welcome. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar hosted by the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations. My name is Victor Trinidad with NCPMI. This webinar is part of the Digging Into Data webinar series. Today's topic is Introduction to the Teaching Pyramid Observation Tool, Teapot, and Teaching Pyramid Infant Toddler Observation Scale, Tipitos, presented by Denise Perez Binder and Anna Winokur. Thank you very much and please proceed. Thanks, Victor. Welcome, everybody. We're so happy that you've joined us for our next Digging Into Data series. Um, this is going to be my favorite one because we're talking about the Teaching Pyramid Observation Tool, or Teapot, which is kind of my love child I love, and hopefully you do too. And we're also going to be introducing the infant toddler observation scale or tippy toes, or Anna is going to help with that. Um, I'm Denise Binder. And so today we're going to just be doing um, some overview of why we think data is so important to our early childhood um, process and our outcomes and our goals. We're going to kind of do a quick overview of the teaching pyramid observation tool, the teapot, and then we're gonna do a quick overview of the infant toddler observation tool, the tippy toes. And then we'll talk about how we can make class-wide decisions from the two different tools. We'll talk a little bit about the similarities between the two tools. And we'll talk a little bit about the differences between the two tools. Um, they both have the same purpose with the same intended outcomes, but there's some little differences so that they're developmentally appropriate for the groups that you're working with. So we always want to kind of ground ourselves when we're thinking about data tools. You know, data is not always a favorite of some people. Some people really love it and some people just it makes them cringe. We wanna make sure that when we're introducing new data points to our coaches, to our practitioners, that it doesn't feel like we're adding more things on their plate. We really need to make sure they understand the purpose and they understand the why we're doing this in order to get that buy-in. So you really get that good, durable data that we're looking for so we can make some good solid decisions and changes in the classroom. We never want data to feel like um, homework, if you will, or if it's some kind of a gotcha because you're going to get punished for whatever this data is going to tell me. We don't want that to be the case anytime we're collecting any data point in the classroom or in a program. So we really want to um, convey a really clear purpose or a function for that data. We think that we, if we can convey that vision, that purpose, then we get that buy-in and we can really make some good decisions we can um, identify the appropriate outcomes, and then we can measure, are we getting to those outcomes that we intended or not? And we can concretely measure that, and we know that we're getting there or we're not getting there. We don't have to like shake the crystal ball or the magic eight ball because we know we've got it. We have the question, we've collected the right data, and now we can um, analyze and summarize that data and make some really good analysis um, ongoing to make sure that we're getting the outcomes that we want for our kids and for our teachers. Oftentimes what we see in schools is we identify a problem with our team members. And then we have all these conversations about how to get to a solution. Um, I think it's the weather. I think it's what's going on at home. And we never get to a clear path to a solution. And we run out of time. There's just not enough time in the day for all that talk. But if we can get a good set of data, 
that is answering the right kinds of questions to address your problem, we get that straight, quick path to a good, solid, durable solution. And that's really what our Digging in the Data series is hoping to um, achieve for everybody, is to get us to that quick solution that um, is gonna be durable, is gonna be long-term, it's gonna affect that program, it's gonna affect that classroom, and it's gonna affect that child for the long-term. So our data tools that we talk about are always rooted in pyramid model. Um, the teapot and the tippy toes are not exceptions to that. So both of these measures will have items on it that help us to determine what level of the pyramid is being implemented in the classroom and what level of the pyramid the teacher may need some extra support around or some coaching. We will have items that help us determine how relationships between the teacher and the child are evolving, relationships between the adults working in the classroom, the relationships between the adult, the teacher, and the families that they support. We have items that help us examine the environment and making sure that the environment is set up in a way that it's engaging to all the young learners in the room and that it's supporting their learning and their growth. We have items on both measures that look at the kinds of social emotional supports that are being implemented in the classroom, um, like friendship skills, like emotional literacy, like problem solving and de-escalation, and how those um, teaching strategies are affecting all the learners in the classroom. And then we both have measures that will help us determine how individual students are uh, being accommodated for. Are we making modifications for individual kids who may need more practice opportunities or may need um, instruction presented in a different way? Are we making those kinds of um, are we making those kind of um, changes for them? And so teapot and tippy toast will help us examine all those levels of the pyramid model. So why we are um, grounding ourselves in the pyramid model, because we really, we know from years of research that the pyramid model really does help kids improve their social emotional skills. It helps teachers to have more tools in their toolbox to effectively support kids who may be um, displaying challenging behavior. Um, we know that it helps programs prepare children for kindergarten, which is our main goal of preschool, right? We want everybody to be ready. We want everybody to succeed when they get into that big kid world. We know that pyramid model builds responsive relationships with the child and with their families so that they leave, they can leave our program with a positive experience about what school is, what learning means for them. They leave with knowing how to build friendships and to maintain those friendships over time, which is important to any person on earth. So the goal of our any of our fidelity tools is really making sure that the implementation of that skill is leading to the outcomes for kids, um, positive outcomes for their families, for teachers, and for the program itself. So we're making sure that we are implementing the pyramid model at all levels, at the program, at the classroom, at the child, and at the family, with fidelity so that we're getting those long-term, those durable changes for kids and their family. So the two measures that we're looking at today are classroom level tools. 
they are built specifically to look at how a classroom teacher or a teaching team is implementing pyramid model. It's not, they are not meant to examine child outcomes or how the kids are engaging or excelling. It's really focused on teacher practices. So classroom level tools. We'll probably say that a couple times throughout. The first tool that we're going to talk about is the teapot, my favorite. Here's the manual that goes along with teapot. And um, we also have a manual for the tippy toes, the teaching pyramid infant toddler observation scale. So both sets of tools have manuals, have scoring booklets, have trainings and lots of guidance to help you um, make sure that you're scoring um, items and indicators in the same way every time you go in and score. Some basics about the measures, um, both of these have these common um, factors. They are both completed by the practitioner coach. So the person that is delivering coaching to the teacher or the teaching team. That is typically the person that completes teapot or tippy toes. We always recommend a pre and a post measure when, um, when feasible. That's our recommendation. Both tools are observation and interview informed rating skills, meaning that the coach goes into the classroom to do a specific observation. And then there's a short interview that the coach does with the teacher um, to give us more information about practices that we may not get to see in a short period of time. The tools are really designed for professional development. It's real, they are really built to help us understand what parts of the model the pyramid model the teachers are implementing well and what parts they need support around so that we as coaches can write action plan goals around we can bring them new resources maybe we can get them into a new training we can help them build that practice so that they're implementing it with fidelity the um, outputs for teapot and tippy toes really help guide the coach and the, the teacher to build action plan goals for the classroom. And those goals really drive their coaching um, debriefing meetings. And then we think that both tools really um, help assess implementation fidelity. So what specific classroom teachers or teaching teams are doing as far as pyramid model implementation in the classroom. So both teapot and tippy toes have a um, specific set of materials that you need in order to be able to use them in the classroom. Um, the manuals, which we just showed, the manuals for both tools has, uh, is full of great information, like definitions of what certain um, items mean. They um, talk through every item on the measure with some sort of scoring guidance that might give you some sort of an example or a rule, like you have to see this two times or three times. Um, and then that gives you lots of clarifications. Like if you see this, then that's a yes. If you don't see it, then that's a no. Um, we recommend strongly that you never try to score a teapot or a tippy toes until you have the manual in your hands and you are well versed in the chapters of the manual and you know how to use it and you've looked through it very carefully. Both tools also include scoring booklets. <clears throat> so the scoring booklet helps the coach with assessing basic classroom information, like how many children are in the classroom, are there children in the classroom that are um, language impaired or dual language learners, so they need information presented in different ways. 
the scoring booklets also include all the items and then lots of spaces for the coach to take notes. This URL at the bottom of this slide is to the Brooks Publishing website where you can take a look at the Teapot and Tippy Toes manuals and scoring booklets and you can order for your program or for your school. So some other similarities between the two tools. Um, like I said, they're observation and interview informed. The observation for both tools is conducted in about two hours. Um, we don't like to really perseverate on the two hour part, but the main focus of your observation is primarily um, a teacher directed activity, a child directed activity, and at least one transition. We focus on the lead teacher. So the teacher that you are sitting down and coaching with and debriefing and action planning, but we do consider the responses, the behaviors of all the adults in the classroom. The second part is the interview. So we always want to sit back and interview teachers that we're coaching. So we get the whole picture of the practices that they use because we don't honestly think we'll get to see all their social emotional teaching practices in two hours. There's a lot of stuff. We um, have the same basic structure. So we have observation items that we need to score based on the observation only. We have items that we score based on the responses to the interview. And we both have um, items that we call red flags. So um, for us, red flags are practices that teachers are um, implementing that may be in contradiction to pyramid model practices. We always say as coaches, if our teachers are doing a lot of red flags or they are scoring yeses on a lot of the red flag items, then they're not doing pyramid yet. And that's okay. That just means that we need, as coaches, need to get some action plan goals around those um, practices. We need to maybe get them into a new training. We may need to get them a different resource that they can watch or read um, so we can change those things as quick as we can. So this is the specific structure to the teapot measure. We start off with eight items that are scored based on the observation only. They have to, you have to have seen it in that very specific two hour observation in order to score those items. That gets really tricky when you've been coaching a teacher for a while and you know she does that thing. You've seen them do that thing, but they didn't do it that day, so they can't get the score. So items one through eight are scored on observation only. We move to the interview portion. The interview starts on item number nine, but items nine, 10, and 11, we can use the how the teacher responds to those interview prompts plus anything we saw in the observation to score those three items, those three items only. The last half of the interview starts on item number 12 and items 12, 13, and 14 are scored based on how the teacher responds to the interview prompt only. And then we move into the red flag items. Remember, I said red flags for us as coaches. Those are priority items. We want to get that practice changed as soon as we can. We feel like they are things that are in contradiction to pyramid model practices. And red flags go from item 15 through item 31. The last item on the teapot, item number 32, is a little bit different because it's looking for how the adults respond if a, a child is engaging in challenging behavior. 
So um, it starts off with a list of 12 defined behaviors that you're specifically looking for. If you see one of those 12 things happen, then you're going to score whether how the teachers or the teaching team responded to that behavior. So that's the structure of the teapot. The um, structure of the tippy toes, as you can imagine, is a little bit different because we're looking at younger kids, infants and toddlers, right? So um, we're looking for opportunities for um, relationship building. What kinds of activities does the teaching team structure to give themselves time to connect and build relationships with children? Um, we're also looking at the engagement of all the young learners and how the teaching team, what kinds of activities do they um, structure to help all kids engage, which is different when you're thinking about babies. Um, we also look at how they promote family involvement in what kinds of strategies they use to engage parents. So we think that's really super important when we're talking about infants and toddlers who for the most part can't talk about how their day went or what happened in their day. So some of the key differences, we just talked about some of the similarities. Some of the key differences between teapot and tippy toes, I think probably the most obvious is the tea, the teapot is designed for preschool age. So ages three to five, we say it's most um, reliable. Its observations get paused if um, kids go outside for recess or for free play, if they leave the classroom for any um, reason, um, if they go outside for mealtime, or if they have snacks inside the classroom, we stop our observation. And we score the teapot across all routines that happen within that two hour period. Now, conversely, the tippy toes is designed for ages birth to three, so infants through those toddler years. The um, observations continue during mealtime, during outside time, um, unlike the teapot. And in tippy toes, there's three specific routines that we're looking for that we score, so we don't kind of do the fluid scoring like teapot. There's three very specific routines that you're looking for and that you'll um, score. So just like with all our other data tools um, at NCPMI, we have Excel workbooks that go along with teapot and with tippy toes so that coaches can generate visual outputs because we think that um, the visual display is really powerful in getting practitioners to see and it's more meaningful for them to really understand what's happening or what's not happening in their classroom related to pyramid model. So this slide shows an example of a teapot um, output. These are the key practices and you can see on the Y axis, it shows the level of implementation on each of those key practices. So we can score our teapot in our scoring booklet, go into our Excel workbook, pop in our scores for each key practice, and then it generates this beautiful bar graph for us automatically. And we can share this visual with teachers. And that is really the driver to our action planning meetings when we start to think about building action plans with our teachers. The teapot workbook, Excel workbook also gives us the ability to score multiple um, 
periods of time. So remember we said that we usually recommend that you do a pre and post delivery of the teapot and tippy toes. So on this graph, I can show those two points in time on one graph. So when I go into my coaching meeting at the end of the year, I can bring this, I can say where we started. We can talk about, remember that friendship um, goal that we wrote and we worked so hard on? Look at where we've come. So we can talk about those very specific things around this um, beautiful output. The Teapot Excel workbook also lets you graph the number of red flags that your teacher has scored yes on. And um, we can, we graph those separate from key practices because it really, uh, we really want coaches to pay very um, close attention to those red flags and making sure that we're monitoring them on an ongoing basis so that we can get them to nose as quick as we can. We also have a separate graph for the challenging behavior item. So we can see how many challenging behaviors were um, as assumed each time we ran the teapot measure in the classroom and what strategies the teachers used if we observed any of those challenging behaviors. So that's the... Um, teapot workbook and in oh and we can also this is really exciting um we can also if you're coaching multiple teachers at a program we can put all those teachers um data teapot data onto one graph so when we go into our program-wide leadership team meetings we can bring this data and we can say as a collective as a group of preschool teachers Here's where we are on key practices. Just like the individual teacher graph, we can do multiple points in time on one graph. So if our leadership team is planning for professional development, we can look at where we are on our teapot key practices and we can think, well, we really don't need to talk about transitions anymore because we're at 100% fidelity. Um, when it comes to structuring our transitions, but we may need to talk about problem solving skills. So instead of spending three hours with professional development around all pyramid model practices, you can make your professional development so concise and to exactly what your team needs and you get a lot of bang for your buck that way. So again, you can download the scoring materials and the Excel workbook from the Brooks Publishing website. Now I think I moved to you, right? Yes, I am going to see if I can request control. I'm, I'm going to hide that because I'm assuming it's showing that sort of awkward black box at the bottom. So it's very, just as there were similarities that Denise just went over between the two tools, the Excel workbooks are similar as well. Um, of course, the practices that are at the bottom are going to be reflective of those that are in the tippy toes. Um, but we can use, we use the data for very similar purposes, um, whether it be supporting individual classroom teachers. Um, so this is an example of a baseline or a pre um, observation that occurred in September. Um, this is what the how the teacher performed during that or the, how the teacher um, what we saw during those two hours of the observation. And then you can see similarly to the teapot, we can look at growth across that time. And it's such a great way to um, be able to celebrate with teachers when they have made um, so many gains. Sometimes it's hard when you're in the classroom to see um, just how much growth you have truly made um, in, in this area. And then as well too, we can look across um, our teachers. So this in this instance, and this can uh, also happens in the teapot workbook, you can look over multiple waves. So it may, might be up to three, which is nice so that you can look over time, um, especially as you know, you're really trying to maintain the fidelity of implementation. Um, so it's always good to know um, if maybe perhaps we had really mastered a certain practice and then over time, sometimes that, that can start to fall to the wayside. But since we have, 
this data over time, we're really able to, to get down to um, what's occurring within our classrooms. So that's really the logistics of the tools, um, the manuals, the scoring booklets, the materials, um, and then what the data would look like when once you have completed um, one, if not multiple observations. Uh, and we know that looking at it in a graphical format always makes it um, more meaningful. But we wanted to take a minute, we're going to watch this video, it's about six minutes long, it's from our friends at DAISY, um, and the link is there at the bottom. Um, you are going to notice that when, um, I'm just going to stop sharing for a second so I can reshare the screen, um, that it's going to start off by saying something along the lines of like this module, and I don't want anybody to think we're showing you a class, um, it really is just um, they have multiple videos like this. Um, so we definitely encourage you to check out their wonderful resources. Um, the one we're gonna watch is going to be um, specific towards what we call the, the link, look, think, act process. Um, and it's gonna walk you through what, what is meant by it. Um, you know, what does it take to, to do the process? And then we're gonna break down um, even further from what this video will show us. And then we'll show you two examples of what that this process could look like with the teapot and then um, with the tippy toes. So I'm gonna make my screen big. I'm gonna hide my panels. Welcome to this learning module on using data to improve your early intervention or early childhood special education program. In this module, you will learn about Look, Think, Act, a simple process for examining and acting on your data. Why should you use Look, Think, Act? Consider the time and resources it takes to collect and report required data. Does all this effort lead to making your program stronger, or are you not sure what to do with all that data? Are you or your colleagues committed to answering questions you have about your program but not completely comfortable using data to act? Look, Think, Act can help. And best of all, you don't need to be a data expert to get started. Look, Think, Act is a process that helps people engage with data and then use data to make program improvements. It works best when teams of people with different perspectives look at data and together figure out what it means. But team members often have different levels of comfort with looking at data. Has anyone handed you papers with charts and tables and asked you to talk about program data and you greet them with a blank stare? Or have you gathered a group of people to review your program and everyone goes silent when you show the data? Look, Think, Act helps get everyone actively involved with the data by providing a structure to look at and reflect on data together. As with most worthwhile endeavors, preparation is a key to success. Preparation will help you and your team use Look, Think, Act efficiently and effectively. There are several ways to prepare. Identify the questions you hope the data will answer, assemble a diverse team, and prepare your data. Start with your question. What is it that you want to know about your program? What problem are you hoping to solve? Which data are going to help you answer the question? Next, consider the diverse perspectives needed to dig into your question. Family members, administrators, teachers, service providers, other colleagues who have a vested interest in your program, people from different racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds, and people with disabilities. Engaging diverse perspectives will help you see, understand, and act on data in meaningful and equitable ways. If you have someone who understands data and can explain the charts and graphs to others, add them to the team. If you do not have someone, yet, then think about who in your community could help. With or without a data person, you are taking a great first step by assembling a diverse team. Preparing to look also requires creating something for your new team to look at related to your question. Create graphs, charts, diagrams, or other ways to show your data that people can understand easily. And it helps if you display your data in ways that are visually appealing and engaging. Now it's time to assemble your team and let the fun begin. Not surprisingly, the process begins with having your team members 
look at the data charts, graphs, and other displays, and share what they see in the data. At the look stage, team members make factual statements about the data. They make comparisons, identify patterns, and point out data that doesn't fit any pattern. Although it can be tempting to begin to interpret or attach meaning to what the team sees in the data, it is critical to have a thorough look at the facts first. This helps team members put their own biases aside and let the facts speak before they begin making conclusions. During the think stage, the team interprets the data. They attach meaning to what they saw. They consider factors they believe may have influenced the data or caused the program to get the results shown in the data. What do the findings from the look stage mean for our work? What are some of the reasons that might have given us the results we see? Now is the time to draw conclusions from the data that will inform action. And finally, the act stage. Your team proposes actions based on the conclusions. Actions may be as simple as collect more data to better understand the problem, or as complex as a change in state or local policy. Look, Think, Act works best when you have a supportive environment for using data to make meaningful program improvements. Building or strengthening a program's culture of data use is one part of creating this environment. You grow a culture of data use when the people in your organization value data and regularly put that value into practice, using data to inform decisions. As people engage in look, think, act, they build their understanding and confidence in using data and grow in their appreciation of the power of data to improve programs. This learning module will help you learn more about look, so we're going to break that down a little bit more for you, but highly encourage you to go back. There's only about like another minute left, but we also wanted to just be mindful of time. Um, so definitely encourage you to use that link to um, check out those other resources. And then we're just going to tie it back to what we had just shared with you um, around our, oops, I just put up the same exact screen. I apologize. Um, and I love the video too. If, if, if you are somebody sitting there who is maybe not, uh, not the biggest fan of data, hopefully that helped um, a little bit too to ease the, any of that anxiety. Or if you work with folks who, who have that similar feeling, I feel like it does a really nice job of taking whatever might feel a little bit scary out of it. Um, but just remembering too, when you think about, um, I know we're talking largely about classroom data, but we're talking about teaching teams and we're talking about leadership teams too, who will be looking at this data. Um, so really making sure, I love the fact how they pointed out having that diverse perspective, um, especially when we're talking about things around challenging behavior or social emotional um, learning. We, want, we know that many people have many different um, lenses when it comes to those ideas. And, um, and ways they can support. So it's important to have that diversity. And there needs to be a process. So the good news is perhaps before um, you are a person who loved data but didn't have a great process as a team of looking at it, or maybe a coach who has been doing teapots and loves the data as well, but was really looking for something a little more systematic, then um, we're in luck. Now we do have a look, think, act that, that you could follow. We need to have those knowledge and skills. Um, I love the beginning of the video when they said, does anyone hand you the piece of paper and you have the blank look? Um, so maybe sometimes we have certain pieces of the knowledge and skills. I've definitely felt that way. Um, but we need to make sure that our team has all of those different pieces. So if you don't have somebody right now who is that, that lover of data, maybe there's somebody in your community or somebody, um, somebody at your program already who uh, just doesn't even know that they love it yet, um, but well, welcome the opportunity to learn more about it. So we are using this data to make decisions. Um, it's not enough to just gather it, but we do want to spend a lot of our time with the anal analyzing it, the really thinking part to it. Um, that, that part, spending time with that, make sure that we're not jumping to conclusions or maybe attributing um, attributing are having the wrong attributes to um, to our problem. But once we analyze that, then we do develop our plan of action and then implement that plan. And just like any good plan, we go back and we evaluate how is it working using data. So it is an ongoing cycle. Our data will help us understand 
you know, if did we meet the goals of our action plan? Um, and we keep continuing on um, with that. So it is ongoing. It's not a one and done. Um, and it is something I love the, the notion of a, like a data culture at your program. It's just part of the way we talk about the pyramid model being the part of our way of work. Um, so is using a, a look, think, act um, process. So here's where it just shows you the first three steps. And then um, especially if you've been doing pyramid model work, you're not new to um, action planning. Uh, so this, this is no different. That. So if you um, aren't familiar with, we do have Look, Think, Act um, supporting documents for you all um, around different tools. We do have them specific to the Teapot Tipitos. It's actually, um, they are together. So it, not only are you looking, is it help you look at um, what kind of data that you uh, might already have, but this document also helps you to think about and what kinds of questions that your team might have, and then what would be some potential action items. So this is just a reminder of what we just got to hear about in the, in the wonderful video. Um, but those really, when you boil down to those three steps, that's exactly what you're doing. Let's take a look. And we're going to do that now um, shortly is look at our teapot data, um, what kinds of questions might we have looking at it, and then what might be some actions. And same thing with our tippy toes. So when we're um, thinking about the guided decision making, and I just mentioned that there are some guiding questions. So if you if you're, don't feel like you are out there on your own, because it helps, um, this document was created to help you just um, to do just that, to take a look at the data. Um, and there's some considerations that we always want to have um, before we even start looking at the data. And they um, help the team, because really, as we know, we already we assembled this diverse team, but just different things to consider, like, if we're looking at teapot and tippy toes data, was the observer um, trained in doing these observations? Had they become reliable in using the tools? Um, did they follow the manual as intended? So these are all important considerations for us to really get the story behind the data. And then looking into um, what are some things we see. So Denise mentioned how with, when you looked at the teapot workbook, you could see where the red flags were. You could look at them across the program. So maybe that's where your team decides we're looking, we're seeing this it's concerning. Here's some ways we can think about it. And then here's some um, action ideas. So when you're also considering data, there's other things besides, depending on which piece of data you're looking at, but especially with teapot and tippy toes. Um, if we see some really um, big different, big changes, especially if maybe uh, practice had been um, pretty high in terms of implementation and it dropped significantly, our team might ask uh, our coach or the team might ask themselves, were there any major changes in the classroom between time one and time two? Did we have a new assistant who came in and um, COVID, let's all acknowledge the fact that that's been a big co contributor to some of those things. But there could be some other external instead of jumping to the idea that um, the teacher, something's going wrong with the teacher, we really want to take some considerations into place. Have they received consistent coaching supports all year round? Um, we know that coaching is key and that's a really critical part if we want to see um, implementation improve. So those are some things that the coach or, or teaching team might ask. And then even just going back to professional development, has this teacher had the pyramid model practice training? I um, mean, what kind of professional development training and support have they really gotten from time one and time two? And there could be lots of reasons why um, maybe they started an observation in the fall, changed rooms a bunch, maybe had to go on a leave for a little while. There's a lot of different reasons, but you can see how the answers to these questions would really impact what your team does in terms of action. So when we're thinking about um, the look, think, act in action, this just helps you to walk right across and see um, what, what are we really think, when we're looking, we're looking at those red flags. But then I mentioned there's are some guiding questions for you when you're thinking. So are they common? Are there common ones across our program? Could it be something that we address program-wide? Um, what might be the contributor to those red flags? Um, just for example, in the teapot, there's some that have to do with environment and how the environment is laid out. So perhaps it's something that we can easily fix by moving furniture or taking a look at how everything's arranged. Again, coming back to training, or maybe it's a procedure issue folks aren't aware of or were misinterpreted or that we as a team need to take a look at. And then are we seeing at least a decrease 
across administrations so that way we know we're moving in the right action in the right direction so when we act we're planning if we come to the realization that lots of teachers are missing some of this key practices training then we know that we need to build that capacity especially if it's, it's one that's common across um across multiple classrooms throughout the program. If it does seem to be that it's a procedural issue and by virtue of following this procedure, we didn't realize perhaps, especially if we're new to implementation, how it's impacting um, things in the classroom. So we would then wanna take a look at maybe some needed changes um, and would wanna do that as a team. So Denise, did I just talk over part of your part? Nope. nope. Um, the next section we wanted to just give a little example of how a coach might share teapot data and tippy toes data with their coach and what or with their teachers or teaching teams and then what we can um, glean from that those conversations so um this is our case study we have sunshine park Pre zoo preschool and they have 48 children in from 18 months to five years and four different classrooms each classroom usually has a lead teacher and one assistant miss lucia is their practitioner coach and she's been coaching teachers at the school for two years this year she began coaching mr chris who is a new hire to the school and Mr. Chris was very excited to learn pyramid model. Um, he's a little bit nervous about coaching because he's never done that before. And, um, but he's excited to grow some skills around pyramid model. I think you have to push me. Okay, so this is um, Lucia's baseline teapot, meaning that the first time she goes into Mr. Chris's classroom to complete the teapot observation. And so this is her graph or her output. We can see practices where he's pretty strong for being brand new and not knowing anything about pyramid model. And we can see areas of um, need or places that we um, can support him as a coach. Remember, we said that we're going to try to do teapots two times a year. And so the baseline would be somewhere around September ish, October ish, hopefully September, um, that you're getting that first one done. As a coach, when I complete my first teapot, I take my scores onto this, what we call the action planning goal goal planning form and you can download this form um, in fillable form off of ncpmi the national center for pyramid model innovations i think it's ncpmi.org now right anna yeah so it um this form helps the coach look at the three practices that were the highest on their teapot graph. So what was what's happening um, that's going well in the classroom. So I just take my graph and I take the form and I just transpose that information. Then I think about the areas where I as a coach would want to action plan around right away. So I'm taking into consideration any red flags that I might have scored. And I write those three areas down. And then I kind of try to prioritize need based on my observation and what the data is telling me. So these are the top three goals that Lucia, the coach, wanted to set for um, Chris. The next form that will come up is a form that we have the teacher do that looks exactly the same as the coach goal planning form. And again, you can download this form from NCPMI. So the teacher fills out this form and they fill it out after they've gone through modules or practices training, what things they think they already do pretty well. The um, three things that they feel are really difficult for them. And then they prioritize the three things that they would like to work on. 
And then we bring these two forms plus the um, baseline graph to our first debriefing coaching meeting. And we put them together and we figure out what things do we have in common, what things are different. And then we um, find some common ground and we talk it over and we can come up with our first action plan goal. And so um, I think if we looked at Lucia's planning form and Chris's planning form, and when they came together, they had one um, priority in common, and that was teaching rules at circle time. So we can highlight that on our planning forms, um, but then we move on to the next thing, which is the action planning form. And together at that same meeting, we sketch out what we think our first action plan um, goal statement is. We think about some action steps, but this is all rooted in that teapot data. If we didn't have that data, we're just kind of thinking like shaking the magic eight ball. I think it should be, um, and let me just tell you, everybody's going to want to do Tucker Turtle. All your teachers want to start with Tucker Turtle. That is not where they need to start. But they, if you let them, that's where they'll start. So we use that data to guide and it makes our work so easy and so transparent because we know exactly what they need and we know exactly where to start. Sometimes we have to do a little guiding so that they know where they need to start but we can um, easily get them there with that beautiful visual output. So we're gonna look at um, another scenario, uh, this time with the tippy toes, and we're gonna be looking at it, um, different school. This time it's the Backyard Bears, and they have uh, four classrooms that support um, infants and toddlers. And they've been implementing the pyramid model in those classrooms for about two years now. They do tippy toes in the fall, and then they do another in the spring. But they and they have coaching all year long. So the these te these four classrooms have had um, pre what you could consider a baseline and a post, or just two two instances of observations occurred. So we have two sets of data, um, and so. Their leadership team is coming together. They're planning for the their new, their new year's coming up. Children are moving classrooms and all of that good stuff is happening and they want to review their data to make some decisions. Um, so one of the things we talked about was they could um, really look across their teacher data and take a look at those average scores for some of those key practices over administrations. Um, and then they could dig in even further and look at the item and, and look at the indicators across those teachers. So when they're looking um, at their infant toddler, their tippy toes, they can take a look and see that in some areas they've made, so the blue is their first wave and then the red is their second. Um, and you can see that they've made a lot of growth in a lot of areas, but they recognize too that there's still some areas that um, haven't really seen improvement and they're just wondering why. So they really want to think, stop and think and ask some questions, having looked at that at the graph. So was there evidence um, of growth across all teachers in the pyramid model? So really taking a look and seeing at least for the overall percentages, were teachers really making gain, at, at least some gains? We know we, we hear those words, it's three to five years for implementation. Sometimes I think we say them so long, but we forget when we're looking at data. Um, that's, you know, that was, um, that we want to really make sure that they have time. It's not going to happen all overnight um, as much as we would like it to. It does take time. So as long as we're seeing some growth, we know we're doing some things right. Um, and then looking at that pattern across teachers. So then going back to thinking, are there common items or indicators that we're just not seeing? Perhaps we can do some really targeted professional development um, around that. So when they look in um, and they decide they're going to focus on some of the key practices, oops, I apologize, let me go back in. Uh, they do notice that their one area that seems to be lower is around supporting um, children with disabilities. Um, but the tippy toes, if there aren't any children with disabilities or who do language learners, that item's always going to look like a zero uh, because there weren't any children at the time of the observation who fell in those two categories. But for the second round, there were, and they still they saw that, okay, we do, we have some work to do in this area. Um, 
that they look, they could also focus on there's other there's other sets of practices. So as a team, how are they going? Where are they going to act? Um, how is it they're going to decide where to focus? Um, they know that we can't again, still can't do everything overnight. But um, thinking back to what's the goal of our program and success and inclusion for all children, perhaps we want to go back and look at how can we really make sure all of our teachers are ready for children who, who come into their classrooms who might be a dual language learner or might have disability. We don't want to wait. So then they decided maybe it was access to the professional development. Um, lots of our infant toddler teachers, the team realized for one reason or another just didn't have um, as much access as perhaps in the past. Um, so they looked at maybe could we do things online or after hours, would Saturday somehow work better? But they decided that targeted professional development event is what was going to happen. So all of their infant and toddler teachers were going to have this professional development around the practices to support our infants and toddlers with disabilities or dual language learners. And then deciding to set a program wide goal. Um, yes, while it's important for our coaching to occur, um, and for all of our teachers to be working towards a, a goal um, that is that they've collaborated with their coach to do. And we also know pro program wide goal could be really effective when you see some over time that there is an area um, that might be lower for whatever reason. So providing that coaching, it's still going to occur, but we're really going to target that key practice. So the team, um, as any good team does, they decided that they were going to um, put this into their action plan. They identified what the steps are going to be that they need um, to address, who is going to be responsible. In some instances, it was a key person and the members of the team. In some instances, it was the coach. But they know that they're, every time they pull out their plan, um, they're going to want to make sure, you know, is that additional coaching happening in those classrooms? After they did those initial steps, did um, is the coaching occurring? What's the progress? And at monthly meetings, they're going to get some kind of feedback as to what's happening. Um, did the professional development and the targeted coaching help to be as effective as they hoped? So they're going to use their, their observation data to help inform that. All right. So I know we only have about three minutes left. Um, but if you're not familiar with the uh, pyramid model, the data roadmap, uh, again, it's available on the website, um, but it, all of those, the examples we just showed you of those look, think, acts are in there with additional um, and such a wealth of information. It really does take any of that, I hate to use the word fear, but sometimes that's what it is around data. Um, it can really, especially if you're a team who's newer at it. So it really provides guidance. You're, you have, you know, what are you looking at? When to look at it? Who should be at the table? And why? We always need to, we always have a why. We're not just looking at data for the sake of doing it. <laughs> so this is an inside view. Um, it gives you a description what some of the sample charts you might recognize from our time here today, um, but it helps the, all of the guides um, are set up in similar ways so that you recognize the look, think, act um, progression. And then if you're not familiar, um, we have a great infographic on, um, I'm going to say challenging behavior, but that word, no, now I just heard you say it and agreed with it. And now I'm blanking on it. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but be sure to share those, those uh, and celebrate those successes. Um, when you do put a lot of effort into whether, whatever it might be around the pyramid model, but you see these, these jumps with data, we have these really great infographics where you can plug in your data and it will um, generate these for you that are shareable for teachers. They're shareable with families. Um, we've seen uh, programs make big bulletin boards using um, the infographics, but it really also helps to see that you know every time you um, have you know, a new set of, of your te teapots and tippy toes, it's a great time to refresh those and celebrate that um, all the hard work that goes into you know move, even moving the needle at all on our implementation tools. Right, do we have time for questions? If you're locating tools, they are on the website um, under data decision making. That brings us to our close. Um, here you can see all of the different um, tools that are available. They are color coded. So if you are part of a state leadership team, you can see yours would be in orange. Then you can see classrooms with green, um, which is what we were talking about. It's only two pieces of the classroom today we were talking about. And then some early intervention programs would be blue. Um, if you're not familiar with the community benchmark quality, there is another webinar on that. And that was down there in gray. And there are additional webinars that are recorded and available on um, the NCPMI website. 
And there are things around um, those early intervention pyramid practices. I mentioned the community-wide benchmarks using the coaching log, and then today on our teapot and tipping tools. So thank you so much for joining us. I think we're, our time is over for today. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to both of our panelists for their wonderful insights. Your feedback is very important to the work that we do. Please remember to provide your feedback on this webinar with our post webinar survey by typing the web address shown on this slide into your internet browser. Your certificate of attendance will appear once you submit the survey. We invite you to visit our website, challengingbehavior.org to sign up for our upcoming webinars, access recordings, download pyramid model resources and more. And thank you to our funder for making this webinar possible. This concludes our webinar. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.